Chapter 1 Tuesday, May 18, SUP, TH, SLASH SUP, 1852. Today, we crossed the South Platte River. For the women, the crossing was not a difficult one, but for the men, I imagine it was much harder. There was no ferryman to help us across and no bridge, so the wagons had to go across on canoes that were left here by the last company to come this way. While the men worked hard to make sure everyone crossed safely, the woman, including myself, watched the children and took care of the mending that needed to be done after so long on the trail. I know we're only about six or seven weeks into our journey, but it does feel like we've been walking forever. The doctor asked me to walk with him tonight, and during that walk, he asked me to be his wife. I wouldn't hesitate to answer, but, well, I'm simply not sure how I feel about being intimate with a man I barely know. It's such a hard thing to decide, but I'm sure with the help of Margaret and Bernice, I'll figure out what I want to do. I hate being a burden on my sister and Joshua, and I pray every day for a marriage proposal, but now that I've had one, I hesitate. Perhaps I'm too frightened to have any idea what I should do. Perhaps I'm truly just a mouse in a woman's body. I must learn to be strong for my sister's sake. She doesn't need me living with her family for the rest of her life. I shall make a decision soon, because he wants an answer within three days. It seems like so little time to decide something that will change my future forever, but it's the time I've been given. I shall endeavor to make the right decision. Perhaps I won't ruin my life. Betty sat with her head down, her plate in her lap. Margaret had asked the doctor to pray over the meal they were sharing at Margaret and Jamie's campfire. Betty had helped to cook and serve the meal as she always did, but that was easy. Cooking and cleaning were things she was happy to do. Sitting and trying to talk to all the men she and Margaret cooked for was another story entirely. Betty listened as Jamie, Margaret's husband, guided the conversation, talking about what they'd passed that day and what good time they were making but she didn't say a word. She never did. She couldn't force her mouth to form words for all the tea in China. For all the fish in Oregon, and from what she'd heard, the fish were jumping out of the water trying to find the fishing lines in Oregon. Instead, she stared into the bowl of rice and beans with a bit of bacon, and she ate. She was afraid to eat too much, because the men might think she was a glutton, and the only purpose behind her eating with Margaret and her family was to find a man to marry. Margaret had been cooking for all of the unattached men on the trail since they'd left Independence, Missouri, because she'd always intended to arrive in Oregon a widow with two young girls. She hadn't expected to fall in love with one of the men she was cooking for and get married. Betty wished she never had to marry, but traveling with her sister and her sister's family had become a burden, well, she was a burden on them, not the other way around. She felt uncomfortable always being around them, and though she had some money stashed aside, and she had paid her own way, she still felt like her brother-in-law, though kind, wished she would find a man, so she could be independent from them. Finding a man was something Betty was endeavoring to do, but her extreme shyness was not her friend. She preferred to escape into other people's lives by reading books, not flirt with men she didn't know over a campfire. She sighed heavily, and she was surprised when Dr. Bentley spoke directly to her. Miss Meeks, is there something the matter? Betty stared at the man, afraid to respond, but she swallowed the bite of food in her mouth and forced herself to say, I'm just thinking about how terribly shy I am and how difficult it is to try to speak with so many people around. There. She'd said something. Perhaps it wasn't what she should have said to the group of people around her, but it was the truth, and how could telling the truth be wrong? The doctor smiled kindly. I understand. I was very shy as a lad. I didn't learn to really speak to people until I was in medical school. Betty blinked a couple of times. But you talk to everyone as if it's easy for you. How could he possibly know what it was like to be painfully shy? It becomes easier every time you do it. Notice, answering my question was difficult for you the first time, 
but you were able to respond to the next thing I said with little trouble at all. Everything is easier with practice. Betty was silent for a moment as she thought about the truth in what he'd said. Perhaps you're right. I never really thought of it that way. She'd never really given speaking to a man she wasn't related to a chance. If she had, it might be easier for her now. I believe it to be true. He watched her through the rest of the meal, as other people talked about different topics. When the meal was over, Betty stood to help Margaret with the dishes, but Dr. Bentley stopped her. Would it cause a great hardship for you if I were to walk with Betty this evening, rather than her helping you to wash the dishes? I'd like to suggest more ways to help her with her shyness. Margaret smiled and nodded emphatically. I would be happy to do the dishes on my own, she said. You go off and walk with the doctor. Margaret held Betty's eyes, letting her know that this was something she needed to do, and Betty nodded, though she was nervous. Margaret was a huge proponent of Betty finding her own husband and having a family. But the doctor? She wouldn't have even thought about stepping out with him. I would enjoy a walk this evening, Betty said, taking the doctor's proffered arm. She had no idea how she would make small talk with the man, but she needed to at least try. As soon as they were out of earshot of the camp, the doctor said, I am pleased you were able to admit your shyness to everyone at supper tonight. I think you'll find the franker you are with people, the more understanding they'll be. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done, which must lead you to believe I've led an extremely sheltered life, and truth be told, I have. Betty sighed. I so prefer to escape into other people's lives with my books than to make any attempt to live my own life. I understand entirely, Dr. Bentley said softly. I remember thinking a girl in my class was the most beautiful human being who had ever lived. She gave me a few sweet smiles, and I knew I wanted nothing more from life than to marry her. I never could get up the courage to even offer to walk her home, so she married a friend of mine. They have four children now. She shook her head sadly. I understand how that could happen very well. I can imagine it would be even harder to be a man with as shy as I am. I would have to be the one asking for walks, and not just the one answering. I have a hard enough time just nodding. He smiled at that. Well, I'm happy you accepted my invitation to walk this evening. I, well, I've been thinking about asking you to walk with me for a while. You're a very beautiful woman, and I've wanted to spend more time with you. It was just hard to know how to ask, when I feared you had no interest in being alone with me. Betty struggled for the right thing to say. I would be amenable to walking with you again, doctor. She felt a wave of shyness wash over her, because she thought he might be expressing a real interest in her. Please, call me Malcolm. She bit her lip, aware that his eyes were steady on her. I, it would feel strange calling a doctor by his first name. There's not a single person on this wagon train who calls me Malcolm. Are you going to force me to live in a world of people too polite to be at all familiar with me? I would like for you to call me by my given name. Betty took a deep breath and nodded. Malcolm it is. Malcolm smiled. I do hope you'll walk with me again. Perhaps we could do it tomorrow after supper? Yes, that would be lovely. Betty wasn't sure why she was talking to him so easily, but perhaps he was right. Maybe it was easier to talk to a man when you had already spoken to him a couple of times. How was the crossing this morning? It was easy for the ladies, of course, but you men had a real job of it. It wasn't as bad as I'd feared. From what I've read the two worst rivers to cross are the North Platte and the Snake River. We'll be traveling on the south bank of the North Platte starting tomorrow evening, and we'll continue there for a good long while. Betty nodded. I think our company is blessed to have such a gifted doctor with us. I know you've already helped many people with ailments and injuries along the way. Malcolm shrugged. I am happy to use my skills to help others. I just wish I could help everyone, and there had been no deaths at all. 
he stopped walking and turned back toward the camp. I don't want to get too far from the circle of wagons. It wouldn't be seemly, and I don't want people gossiping about you. Betty nodded. Thank you for worrying about my reputation. She found every minute she was with the doctor, she felt a little more comfortable with him. I know your brother-in-law a bit, but everyone in camp knows those nephews of yours. They're little scalawags. He said it with a big smile on his face, so she couldn't possibly be offended. She smiled. I love them both, but they are difficult to control. Every day they seem to find new mischief to get into. How long have you lived with your sister and her family? He asked. Not long. Our parents were killed in New York while the cauldrons were getting ready for this journey. I had nowhere to go, so they graciously invited me to go along, but I feel like I'm a burden to them. How so? I know you help with minding the children and cooking. I've seen you do it. Well, yes, of course, but it can't be easy to have your sister living with you as I do. I think they would be very happy to have me married off. As soon as the words were out of Betty's mouth, she wished them back. Would the doctor think she was hinting at marrying him? That didn't sound like I wanted it to. Don't worry about how it sounded. He stopped walking and turned to face her. How would you feel about marrying me? It would save you from feeling like a burden, and I wouldn't have to pay for my meals any longer. Also, it would be nice to have a companion. Betty bit her lip, thinking about it. I just don't know if I'm ready for, well, the intimate side of marriage. She knew her face was flaming red as she said the words to him, but surely, he would understand. I can see that. I am afraid I rather look forward to the intimate side of marriage. I would want it to start immediately. Perhaps, you should consider my offer, and give me an answer in a few days, when we have gotten to know one another better. Betty nodded, the very idea of doing something so, well, so intimate with a virtual stranger, bothered her greatly. Of course, the captain doctor was so kind and tender with his patients, she could just imagine how his hands would be on her skin. She shook her head, stopping that thought. I will consider it, Malcolm. I do believe it's a very good offer, but I will have to decide if I am ready to take that step. Fortunately, we have a pastor in our party, and if we decide to marry, it could happen immediately. Yes, fortunately. Betty knew it would be better for her if they didn't have a pastor, because then she could have more time to mull the situation over in her mind. She'd heard it was all right for the wagon master to marry a couple while on the trail, but she wasn't certain if it was true. She bit her lip. This was the reason she'd begun eating with Margaret and her family, though. To find a man who would make a suitable husband. And while the doctor was a good bit older than her, and rather plain, it wouldn't matter if he was a kind man. I will try to have an answer for you by Friday night, if that suits you. Malcolm smiled. That would suit me beautifully. He once again offered his arm, and she took it. His arm felt good under her hand, and she could feel the strong muscles under his shirt. Even if he hadn't been muscular when they'd left Independence, all the time he'd spent driving his team of oxen was sure to make him stronger every day. She wasn't certain if it was her imagination, or if he had an extra spry bounce to his step as he headed toward the camp. As they walked, he talked about what his plans were when he arrived in Oregon. I have heard that most of the families are planning to settle near one another. I like that idea, if you do. And I plan to start a practice once we arrive. I don't expect to make a lot of money, and I know I'll be paid with eggs and livestock frequently, but I will be needed, and that's important to me. Betty could picture the life they could have together, if only she could get up the nerve to say yes to him. And yes, to a wedding night. That was the frightening part. She would have to consider a great deal. When they arrived back in camp, Margaret had finished the dishes, and Betty frowned. She'd planned to help. The doctor kindly bent over her hand and kissed it before heading to his own camp. 
Unfortunately, Margaret was spending time with Jamie and her girls. Betty needed to talk, and she would have preferred to talk to her friend. There would be plenty of time as they walked toward the North Platte River the following day. She knew that as long as she had a good friend and her sister at her side, she could make any important decision. As she settled down in her tent for the night, her mind was on the doctor. How was she supposed to know if she should marry the man? Hopefully, if she prayed about it, God would help her find her answer. Asterisk. As Malcolm left Betty that evening, he couldn't stop thinking about how happy he would be if she would agree to be his wife. He hadn't realized she was even part of their company until she'd started eating meals with the group Margaret cooked for, but as soon as he'd seen her, he'd known. She was meant to be his bride. Hopefully, he'd be able to convince her of the same thing. After leaving her, he rolled out his bedroll and laid in the dark, staring up at the stars. Why were they so much more beautiful tonight than he'd ever seen them? Was it because Betty had agreed to walk with him? He hoped she would seriously consider his proposal. He knew that he'd have a better chance if he'd just agree to put off the wedding night, but he didn't want to start their marriage off on the wrong foot. No, a wedding night was necessary. Besides, he was already 32 years old, and he wanted children. He judged Betty to be in her early 20s, and though he was a decade her senior, he knew they would be a good couple. He could feel it with everything inside him. He rolled to his side and went to sleep, images of Betty filling his mind. Hopefully she'd answer the way he needed her to. Asterisk. Betty stayed close to camp the following morning, not wanting to accidentally run into the doctor. Not until she'd had a chance to think about his offer. She needed to know exactly what she wanted to do before she ran into him again. As the wagons lined up to start the day, she joined Margaret and her sister, Bernice, and the three of them got ready for their walk. She enjoyed Hannah and Mary's company as well, but she really didn't want to have this discussion with all of them. It would be better with just three. Thankfully Hannah and Mary were making the new widow more comfortable by walking with her and helping with her little ones. Every time Betty saw the two of them, she was a little more impressed with just how good their hearts were. Sure, Mary was no one's idea of a perfect lady as she walked with her musket slung over one shoulder, but Betty couldn't fault her. She was truly a good person, and her inner beauty shone around her, creating a bit of a gleam. It was no wonder she and Hannah were so close. The preacher's wife was only matched in utter goodness by her friend Mary. As soon as they were far enough from the others to really talk, Betty told Margaret and Bernice what she had discussed with the doctor the previous night. Dr. Bentley has asked me to marry him. Margaret gasped. During your walk last night? Betty nodded. Yes, he wants an answer by Friday evening. She had no idea how she was supposed to answer the question, but she was going to have to figure it out. Quickly. Bernie shook her head. I didn't even know you walked with him last night. Why is your sister always the last to know these things? Margaret only knows because she was there when he asked me to walk. Betty shook her head. I would agree immediately if he would agree to give me time before we had a wedding night, but he won't. I don't know if I can do that with a man I barely know. Bernice frowned. Has he kissed you? She asked. No. Well, yes, but only my hand. He was very gallant about it. Betty waited for one of them to give her advice, but both seemed to be holding their tongues. Margaret was quiet for a moment. You need to ask him to kiss you. If his kiss makes you feel, well, weak in the knees is probably the best way to put it, then you should marry him. It's not a problem to make love immediately. It's a gloriously wonderful experience for both the husband and the wife. Betty stared at her friend in shock. It is? That was certainly not what she'd been given to understand. She was very surprised her friend would say that, though she knew Margaret wouldn't lie to her. Oh yes. Wouldn't you agree, Bernice? 
Bernie snotted emphatically. Definitely. That's why Joshua and I leave camp so often. We're wanting to be able to make love without being heard. And we enjoy ourselves, so we like to do it often. That makes sense to me, Betty said. So, by kissing him, I'll know if he's the right man for me? I think so, Margaret said. I mean, you know he's a decent man, and you've seen his kindness with others. Now if you know there's a spark between you, then it will work for you to marry him. That's all there is to it. So, I need to see if I'm weak in the knees? Bernice nodded. Or if he makes your stomach flutter. If when he kisses you, you never want him to stop. Bernice looked at Margaret and then back at Betty. If you tingle in your secret place. Betty gasped at her sister's plain speech. Mother would not be happy if she heard this conversation. But then she smiled. It was nice to be able to speak so honestly with her sister. Yes, but mother isn't here anymore, and I am. What should I do? Tell you to close your eyes and let him do what he wanted to do to you like she told me. Bernie shook her head. No one should go into marriage completely unprepared for the marriage bed, Betty. I won't let that happen to you. Margaret smiled. She's right, Betty. My mother told me nothing. She made it sound like it would be something I would hate, and that I just needed to pretend it wasn't happening while he took care of his needs. I don't think you need to fear making love. You need to embrace it. That's not what I've ever believed. How odd. I will consider this and ask him to kiss me on our walk tonight. Bernice grinned. And you'll report back? We want to hear about your tingles. I'll report back as to whether or not I will accept the man as my husband. You do not need to know if there are any tingles or where said tingles take place. Betty shook her head. You're my sister, but we don't have to share everything with each other. For instance, you've never talked to me about the tingles Joshua makes in you before. Bernice laughed. I probably would have if I didn't think you'd run screaming into the night. Those tingles keep me going. Margaret giggled. I have to agree with your sister, Betty. Jamie makes me tingle in all the right places. Betty blushed and looked around. We've already left the South Platte River it seems. Bernice laughed. Yes, and you changed the subject so nicely. Today is supposed to be a long one, and the men really don't want to stop until we reach the banks of the North Platte. Betty nodded. From everything I keep hearing, we shouldn't camp without timber or fresh water whenever we can avoid it. No, we shouldn't. It's not smart at all. The animals need water, even if we don't. Margaret shrugged. The little bit of water we carry with us should be saved for cooking. We need to be near fresh water every minute we can be. The conversation turned to more mundane things after that but Betty couldn't quit thinking about what it would be like to kiss Malcolm. Would he even be willing to kiss her? She guessed he would, but how would she even ask him? It would be a strange conversation no matter how they put it. When they stopped for their abbreviated noon meal that day, Betty told Bernie she'd like to be the one to stay in the wagon with the boys that afternoon. With as rambunctious as the Cauldron boys were, it didn't work to just put them in the wagon to nap. All sorts of messes occurred when that happened, and neither woman enjoyed cleaning them up. Everyone ate quickly because they knew they wanted to go further than usual that day to avoid camping with no water. As she settled in for a bumpy afternoon, knowing she couldn't read in the back of the wagon without losing her lunch, she sat down and closed her eyes. She would hear if the boys got into mischief, and she imagined how her kiss with Malcolm would go that evening. Betty had always had an overactive imagination, which was probably why she enjoyed reading so much. She imagined everything happening in her mind as she read the words on the pages. She didn't just read a book. She lived it. And now she was living a kiss with Malcolm in her mind, over and over again. As soon as they reached the North Platte River, 
the entire company cheered and stopped. The wagons were circled to protect them all, and Betty joined Margaret at her wagon, where they would prepare supper and feed the extra men. An entire extra family had begun joining them for their evening meals. The Henderson family had lost their wife and mother, and though they'd tried to make it through on their own, they'd realized they really needed to have someone to cook for them. All the food they'd stocked up on did nothing when there was no one to cook it. It was another night where they had beans, rice, and bacon. It wasn't Betty's favorite trail meal by a long shot, but it was an easy meal to make, and it didn't require fresh meat. They could use the bacon they had purchased back in Independence. There had been no time to hunt with them moving a few extra miles that day, even though Mary had her musket over her shoulder the entire day. There just hadn't been much game in sight. Betty helped with the cooking, and she carried food to the different people to serve them. The group seemed to grow all the time, and she was happy she was there to help Margaret. She knew her friend wanted to earn extra money for when they reached Oregon, and though Jamie didn't need Margaret to earn more, Margaret needed to do it for her own peace of mind. That night the doctor prayed over the meal, and Betty found herself watching Malcolm instead of staring down at her plate the entire time. He was a polite eater, keeping his mouth closed as he chewed. She watched his lips move as he ate his meal, and she couldn't help but wonder how his lips would feel on hers. And then she would blush. At one point the doctor caught her watching him and their eyes met. It was just a quick glance before she looked away, but she felt it deep inside her. Was this the fluttering tummy her sister and Margaret had warned her about? If the man could make her feel this way with a look, how would she feel when their lips met for the first time? As soon as the meal was over, Betty helped Margaret gather the empty dishes, and then Margaret made a shooing motion with her hand. It was obvious to Betty that her friend wanted her to spend her time with the doctor and not in the camp. Hopefully the walk would go well, and she could tell her sister she was marrying. She took the doctor's arm, and they slowly walked away from the circle of wagons. Chapter 2 Wednesday, May 19, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 Today we journey along the South Platte River, and I look forward to the miles and miles ahead of us instead of dreading them as I have done in the past. We only have two people in the company who are sick or injured for a change, and it has been easy going. Mrs. Jackson will be giving birth any day, but I'm not sure if she'll call for me or for Mrs. Mitchell, who has proven to be one of the best midwives I've ever had the pleasure of working beside. It's nice that women in this company have both options. This evening, I will once again walk with Betty Meeks. I've admired her since I first realized she was part of our wagon train, which I have to admit was only a short while ago. It seems she spent all of her time hiding in the wagon with her precocious nephews and using them as an excuse not to have to meet new people. She is incredibly shy, you see. I have asked for her hand in marriage, and I have no idea if she'll favor me with an answer tonight or if she'll make me wait until Friday. I dearly hope she won't keep me in suspense, but I will understand if she does. I cannot wait to spend more time with her this evening either way. She is a wonderful cook, good with children, and helps clean every night. She would make a good wife for me. Betty waited until she and Malcolm were out of sight of the wagons before she stopped walking and turned to him. Never in her life had she done something quite as bold as she was about to do, but she wasn't nearly as afraid as she'd expected to be. This was the right thing to do, and she knew it. This is going to seem out of character for me, and truthfully, it's very out of character. Malcolm frowned. What is? I want you to kiss me. You see, Margaret and my sister Bernice have both told me that when a man kisses you, it should make you feel a certain way. I want to know if you make me feel something so that I can move forward with a marriage with you. A slow smile crossed his face. You're asking me to kiss you? In a million years, he never would have guessed she'd do that. She was a surprise to him in so many ways. Betty blushed. 
Let's call it an experiment in human behavior. She wanted to back away, but she stood her ground. I'd rather call it a kiss. His hands moved to her waist, and he pulled her toward him. Perhaps this was a bad idea, she couldn't believe how hot her face felt and how tingly she felt underneath his hands. Surely, she wasn't supposed to be kissing a man she wasn't married to, but how else would she know if he was the right man? There was no way according to her confidence, but maybe they were just trying to watch her make a fool of herself. No, neither of them would ever do that, but still, it was an odd situation she'd allowed them to put her into. This is the best idea I've ever heard in my life. Now, if you could just stop talking for one moment, I will kiss you. Betty had never been asked to stop talking in her life. She'd never talked enough for anyone to tell her to stop. She was almost offended that he would even insinuate she talked too much. That wasn't very nice. He chuckled, and he lowered his head toward hers. Betty felt her eyes flutter closed, and his breath was upon her lips for just a split second before his mouth descended upon hers. It felt odd to have another human so close to her, touching her so intimately, but so much more than that, it felt good. She took a step closer to him and stood on her tiptoes pressing against him. His lips, they seemed to be sparking something in her that she hadn't even known existed. She never wanted this kiss to end. When they finally pulled apart, she stared up at him with wide eyes, her lips parted slightly. I'll marry you. It felt right. It all felt right. Marrying him was the answer, and she didn't even know what the question was. Malcolm grinned, hugging her close. I'm thrilled. Sunday? When we stop. Do we have to wait? Betty asked. She rather liked the idea of continuing what they'd just started, and she knew it wouldn't be appropriate before she married him. If her sister and Margaret were right about it feeling good, why not just do it? It made sense to her. Besides, waiting would just give her time to be nervous, and it was best if she didn't have that time. He blinked a few times. You want to ask Pastor Scott to marry us tonight? He loved the idea, but he was surprised she was willing to move so quickly. Betty nodded. Why not? I suppose there is no real reason not to. He grinned at her. Let's go get married. When they got back to camp, Betty hurried to Margaret first. We're getting married. Tonight. Margaret laughed. In a hurry? I understand what you and Bernice are talking about now, and I see no reason to wait until the weekend. Or start stewing over whether I'm making the right decision. Nor do I, Margaret said. Run and tell Bernice while I finish up the dishes. The girls will be sleeping in another half hour, so we need to hurry if the children are to come. Yes, I definitely want Jimmy and Johnny there. Betty hurried across the camp toward her family's wagon. Bernie, she called, using her sister's childhood nickname. Betty, what is wrong with you? Bernice asked, frowning as she pushed an errant strand of hair from her face. I'm about to get married. I do hope you'll come. Bernie stared at her sister for a moment and then laughed. You must have taken our advice and asked him to kiss you. I haven't seen you look that excited about anything for a very long time. Probably since you got that china doll you so desperately wanted for Christmas. Oh, Bernie. I had no idea a kiss could be so wonderful. Why, it was better than the best book in the entire world. Betty felt like she should spin in a circle to proclaim her happiness, but instead, she stood quietly. You're getting married this weekend? Bernice asked, putting the cook pot back in the wagon. No. I'm getting married now. Malcolm went to get the pastor. Now? You share one kiss and suddenly you have to marry in minutes? You have lost your mind. Bernice stared at Betty as if she'd grown two heads. Probably. I want to marry before the boys go to sleep, so we need to hurry. I'm hurrying. 
Bernice dried her hands on her apron and looked around. Her boys were playing in the center of the wagons, with her husband watching over them. Run and get Joshua and the boys and tell them. The boys will need their hands and faces washed and their hair combed. I'm the one getting married in a matter of minutes. I'll wash my hands and face while you fetch your boys. Betty shook her head as she took water from the bucket and carefully washed her hands and face, patting her hair with water as she tried to tame it down. Her hair had a natural wave to it that tended to fight its way out of her bun. When she'd finished, she removed her apron, something she was used to wearing all the time on the trail, and she smoothed the front of her dress. There was really no time to change, so she'd have to marry in green. Not that she cared. She'd marry in any color as long as she could get married that night. Bernie stopped in front of her sister with a smile. You look beautiful. Stop fretting and remember what his kisses feel like. Like they make my knees weak? Betty asked, glad that she knew she could say that, and her sister would understand. Bernie shook her head. Run and tell Mary what's happening before she and Bob leave camp. The two of them like to sleep under the stars. Where no one can hear them? Betty asked. She'd learned more than she probably should have from the short conversation with Bernice and Margaret that afternoon. That's why they like to leave camp. Bernice smiled at her sister. Now go. I need to get the boys ready. Betty hurried over to Mary, whom she liked a lot, but she didn't feel nearly as comfortable with Mary as she did with Margaret. When Betty reached Mary, Mary was just pulling two blankets out of the back of the wagon she shared with Bob. Mary, wait. Mary turned to Betty with a smile. What am I waiting for? I'm about to marry Dr. Bentley. I was hoping you'd come to the ceremony. Mary smiled, setting the blankets down and squeezing Betty's hands. I'm so happy for you. She didn't even look surprised that it was happening, which thrilled Betty. She'd expected a lot more questions than she was getting. Betty smiled. I'm happy too. I'm going over to the pastor's wagon to see if they're ready for me. I'll be there as soon as I find Bob. Mary immediately started looking around, trying to spot the man she'd married. Most of the men are in the center of the wagons, Betty told her friend as she hurried away. She found Malcolm with the pastor and his wife, Hannah. She wasn't sure what to say, so she simply walked over and stood beside the doctor. Hannah grinned at her. I'm glad you two found one another, she said, clapping her hands together. I like you both so much, and seeing you together brings so much joy. Within moments, they were joined by Betty's family, Margaret, Jamie, and their girls, along with Mary and Bob. Pastor Scott looked between Malcolm and Betty. Do you need anyone else to be part of this ceremony? he asked. Betty looked around her and shook her head. No, sir. This is who I need here with me. Her eyes met Bernice's for a moment, and she knew her sister was thinking of their parents, just as she was. No matter though. The ceremony was short and sweet, and within minutes, Malcolm and Betty were pronounced husband and wife. When Malcolm was invited to kiss his bride, he immediately lowered his head and kissed Betty. It was a different kind of kiss than they'd shared alone on the prairie, and Betty thought that was probably a good thing. She didn't want to feel all that Malcolm had made her feel there in front of everyone. Bernice handed Betty a small bag. Everything you'll need tonight is in the bag. We'll work on moving the rest of your things from our wagon to yours on Sunday when we have a rest day. Betty nodded, easily accepting that she didn't get rest days on the trail because she was a woman. Days of rest were for men, in her experience. She hugged her sister. Thanks for dropping everything to be here. There were no cotillions this evening, so I thought my social calendar needed something to keep it going. Bernie said with a wink. Betty slipped her hand into Malcolm's, and the two of them walked toward his wagon. Do you want to sleep in the circle of the wagons tonight? 
Or will we go out on the prairie like all of the other couples who desire to be amorous? It seemed strange to her that she knew they were about to engage in relations, but she was truly looking forward to it, thanks to her conversation with Margaret and Bernice. Malcolm smiled at her. I think that would be nice. You don't mind? She shook her head. I don't mind at all. She couldn't wait to spend time alone with him and learn about what Bernice and Margaret were telling her early that day. Surely, they hadn't made up how wonderful marital relations were. No one would have more than one baby if it was awful, would they? Are you nervous? he asked, sensing a bit of a change in her mood. A little. I wasn't earlier, but now that we're legally married, and I know I'm your property, it's different. Betty's mind was scrambling a little, wondering what she'd done. I will never think of you as my property, he said, shaking his head. You're my wife, which makes you my partner. Betty nodded. She wasn't sure she completely believed him, but she knew he believed what he said, and that helped a little. I'll remember that. Malcolm was at a loss as to what to say to his pretty new wife. He'd expected it to take him days to convince her to marry him, and now he found himself with her at his side for the rest of his life. How did Mrs. Jackson do with the walk today? Her baby will be here any day. It always felt safe to talk about medicine. I haven't seen Mrs. Jackson walk with our group of women, so I'm really not certain. I haven't noticed her walking at all, come to think of it. Betty hadn't thought about how hard it would have been for a woman that far along to walk, but she should have. She'd been too busy worrying about her own circumstances. He found a spot that he felt was far enough from the camp to be an appropriate place for their wedding night, and he stopped. Would you like me to spread the blanket out? He wanted to throw the blanket onto the ground and then her on top of it, but he knew better. Betty nodded. Yes, please. Once he'd smoothed out the blanket and made them a bed, he took her hand and pulled her to him. His lips descended on hers, and she remembered why she'd been in a hurry for their marriage. Her arms went around him seemingly of their own accord, and she lost herself in the kiss they shared. Then there was a gunshot from the camp, and Malcolm pulled away. I need to see if I'm required. With that he turned and headed back toward the camp. She hurried after him. Won't someone let you know if something is wrong? It didn't make sense to her that he would just head back to camp so quickly in the middle of, well, what they were doing. That's the signal we set up on our first day on the trail. I need to respond if there's a gunshot, and there was. I see. He stopped and turned to her for just a moment. I'm sorry. I know this is disappointing, and it's disappointing for me too. I hope to be able to get right back to what we were doing, but I need to make sure that I'm not needed as a doctor first. And if you are, she asked. Surely, he wouldn't be putting his duties as a doctor before her for the rest of their lives. Then I'll have to take care of whatever is wrong before I can return to you. I'm sorry, but I'm a doctor first and a man second. Will it always be that way? What if one of our children is sick? We're going to have to be able to consummate our marriage before we can have children, so I wouldn't worry about that just now. Malcolm frowned. He was very annoyed at the timing, but still aware of what he needed to do as a doctor. She sighed. Being married to a doctor is going to be harder than it seemed a few hours ago, isn't it? I'm afraid so. With a quick kiss, he hurried into camp, and she followed behind him. You don't have to come with me? If you're needed, I can at least help. Betty shrugged. She was a doctor's wife, and that seemed to come with responsibilities. Do you have any nursing experience? She shook her head. Just a little. I worked with orphans before my parents died, and occasionally, they were sick. Well, come on then. We'll work together. When they reached camp, there was a small girl, sitting on the ground crying, and Jed Scott was beside her with a musket. 
He nodded at the girl, so they would know that's why they'd been called back to camp. It wasn't someone Betty was familiar with, but she immediately knelt beside the girl. Are you hurt? My mama is sick. Betty frowned, not sure why the girl would be alone. Show us where your mama is. Following the little girl to their wagon proved interesting. All the wagons looked the same, so she had to poke her head under each one and finally she found her sick mother. Here. Malcolm squatted beside the wagon. Are you all right? The woman moaned, clutching her stomach. I have never felt so dreadful in my life. Do you drink coffee, ma'am? He was already certain of the answer. She had cholera from not drinking coffee. He was unsure why coffee made such a difference in the awful disease, but it did. No. I've never much cared for it. The woman lay on her side, curling around herself. I've found that it's always those who don't drink coffee that get cholera. Malcolm shook his head. Where is your husband? He's sick too. He left camp to see to necessities. Malcolm sighed. I'll go try to find him. Betty frowned. No, I'll send some men to find him. You stay here with Mrs. Nelson. Polly Nelson. And someone needs to look after Annabelle. Betty go to her feet and went to her brother-in-law, Joshua. Mr. Nelson left Camp Ill, and we need to find him. Mrs. Nelson isn't doing well at all. Joshua nodded, putting his hat on his head. I'll gather a couple of men to help. Betty and Malcolm sat with the sick couple into the early hours of morning. They took their last breaths within minutes of one another, with Polly going first and then her husband. Their little girl, an only child, spent the night with Margaret and her girls away from her sick parents. Malcolm got to his feet after they lost Mr. Nelson. I'll let the captains know that some graves will need to be dug first thing before we leave. Will that slow us down? Betty asked, well aware that they were doing all they could to reach Oregon before the snow started to fly. We're ahead of schedule. Even if we're delayed by half a day, we'll be just fine. Betty was exhausted. I need to sleep. So do I. I regret that we'll have to wait for our wedding night. He stroked a hair out of Betty's face. Thank you for sitting with me. You could have slept. She shrugged. I like to be of use when I can. They walked toward his wagon, realizing at the last minute his blankets were still out on the prairie. We'll get them later, he told her. I have another set of blankets, and we'll use those to sleep on tonight. He pulled the blankets out and spread them, and she happily lay down on them. I'm so tired. I am too. He pulled her into his arms and closed his eyes. If he couldn't make love with her that night, he'd at least sleep with her in his arms. She yawned widely, resting her head on his bicep. Good night, Malcolm. He kissed her forehead. Good night, Betty. His eyes closed and within moments, he was asleep. Betty watched him for a moment, thinking about how being able to fall asleep so quickly must really be a good ability with his busy schedule. She wished she could do the same. She lay awake for a long while, exhausted, but unable to sleep. She wasn't used to having someone touch her in her sleep, and she wasn't sure how she'd ever learned to sleep in his arms. When she finally drifted off, she moved closer to him in her sleep, content to be in her new husband's arms. Life would never be the same now that she'd married Malcolm. If she was sure of nothing else in the world, she was certain of that. Chapter 3 Thursday, May 20, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 Oh, diary, I have so much to report. You'll think me crazy, but I married Dr. Bentley last night. He's a good man and though we spent our wedding night tending to a sick couple and eventually watching them both die, I cannot regret my decision. Today, we are resting in place. Two graves had to be dug before we could leave, and then some of the livestock scattered during the night. 
I have no idea how, but it happened, and they had to be rounded up. And Malcolm and I didn't get any sleep until shortly before dawn, so we were allowed to sleep in. We missed the funerals of the Nelsons, and though I wish I'd been able to pay my last respects, I am thankful for the extra sleep we were allowed. I'm not sure if I could have made it through the day on so little sleep. I look forward to spending the rest of my life with a kind, gentle man who has made me feel as if I am important to him. Hopefully, there won't be more medical emergencies for a short while, and we will have time to get to know one another better. Despite the deaths, yesterday will always be remembered with joy. Betty woke late in the day, and she scrambled, worried that the entire company was waiting on her. She and Malcolm were sleeping, and they seemed to be the only ones resting, but no one was watching them, which was a relief for her. She got up and started a fire before taking a bucket to the river for water and taking care of her needs. When she got back to the fire, she saw that Malcolm was up as well, and he was gone, probably checking on some of the sick in the camp. She hadn't realized just how busy he was being the only doctor in their company. It certainly felt like they'd had a lot of accidents and illness during their journey. By the time he returned, she had breakfast ready for them. It was a simple meal of Johnny cakes, but with a little of the honey she found stashed in the back of his wagon, she knew they would be delicious. It was strange feeling like she was supposed to just look through his belongings for the ingredients and cooking tools she needed to make the meal, but she didn't know what else she was supposed to do. She served them both steaming cups of coffee to go with the treat, and then she sat down in front of the fire, which was already hot on her face. Do you know what time it is? she asked. Did the company wait for us? It's past ten in the morning, he said with a yawn. I rarely sleep this late, but last night was hard. The company decided we could lose a day today to bury our own and decide what to do about little Annabelle. Has a decision been made yet? Betty asked, thinking about how much she liked the little girl. Malcolm shook his head. No one has stepped forward to raise her yet. I hope someone will soon because she's a sweet girl. She shouldn't have to feel alone and worry about her fate now that her parents are gone. Betty looked at her plate for a moment, and then the words slipped out. Could we? She felt like she was asking for too much, but she desperately wanted the little girl. Her heart went out to her, and she felt like Annabelle should be hers. Malcolm smiled. I was thinking the same thing. Let's offer. Really? She was excited at the idea. I didn't think you'd be willing. She realized every moment that he was an even better man than she'd first thought. I want dozens of children, but I know how hard childbirth is on a woman. If we can take on a dozen before we reach Oregon, it won't be enough. Thank you. She wasn't certain he was telling the truth, but she loved the idea of having many young people to love. Hopefully, he would be willing if there was another child, and another. Don't thank me. You'll be doing the bulk of the work. His eyes met her steadily, and he hoped Betty knew what he was saying, he would be too busy taking care of others to be able to be there for a lot of the child-rearing. Though Betty knew he was telling her the truth, she didn't mind one bit. She leaned over and brushed a kiss on his cheek. We'll tell her after breakfast. Does she know about her parents? Malcolm nodded. She was told first thing this morning. Poor little thing. She can't be more than four or five. She'll bounce back. They all do. As soon as breakfast was over, even before Betty washed the dishes, they walked over to Margaret's wagon. Margaret was selling baths, which she usually only did on Sundays. Betty smiled. A bath would be nice. Perhaps Malcolm wouldn't mind if she spent some of the money she had saved on a bath. Her money, and everything else she held dear, was now his property, and she would need to ask to use it. Margaret, where's Annabelle? Betty had to wonder if any of the other families in the company had been close to the Nelsons. It seemed like there would have to be someone, but no one had stepped forward, so perhaps not. 
Margaret gave Betty a sad smile. She's playing with the girls back behind the wagons. All right. Betty walked around the wagon, aware that both Margaret and Malcolm were following her. Hello, Annabelle. Annabelle stopped playing and looked at the doctor solemnly. Hello. I'm really sorry about your parents, Malcolm said. I did everything I could, but they were too sick. Thank you, sir. Annabelle looked down. Where will I go now? Will someone send me back to Georgia? From the look of the girl, it was obvious she already felt like she was a burden, and it broke Betty's heart just a little. Betty stepped forward and walked to the girl, squatting in front of her. Would you like to go to Oregon with the doctor and me? As our little girl? Annabelle looked at Betty solemnly before nodding. I would like that. She said the words, but there was no real feeling behind them. As a child, she understood she had no choice. We'll get your things out of the wagon and move them into ours. Yes, please. I'll help. Annabelle looked at Amanda and Sally. I have to go and help the doctor's wife. She's going to let me go to Oregon, so I have to start earning my keep. Betty gasped at the words wondering where the little girl had gotten her ideas from. No, Annabelle. We're going to adopt you and keep you as our daughter. You won't have to earn your keep. Betty worried about what thoughts the child had that would lead her to think she needed to work for her food and lodging. Annabelle just nodded. Let's go get my things. Betty looked at Margaret, who shrugged at her. We'll talk later. Betty whispered as she walked past her friend. There was too much to do to worry about how Annabelle was acting at just that moment. They'd sort it all out later. Most of the day was spent moving the objects from one wagon to another. First, they moved Annabelle's things and the rest of the food that was left in the Nelson family wagon to their own. They would now have plenty to share with others. Then they moved Betty's things into Malcolm's wagon but they didn't take any of the food that had been purchased for Betty. You just share with others. We have enough from Annabelle's family stores. Betty felt like the food the girl's parents had left behind should go to her and the doctor. Bernice nodded, smiling at Annabelle, who was trailing along behind Betty, always trying to help. You really can go play with your friends, Betty said for the fiftieth time. No, it's my responsibility to help, Annabelle said. I need to earn my keep. Betty sighed. All right. They each took an armload of clothes back to Malcolm's wagon, and after Betty had stored it all, she brushed off her hands. We did it. That's all we need to do now. Is it time for me to help you see to the noon meal? Annabelle asked. You don't need to. I enjoy cooking. Go play and I'll call you when the meal is ready. Annabelle shook her head. No, I have to earn my keep. Betty wanted to cry for the girl. She couldn't seem to get through to her for anything. Have you played with Mrs. Scott's kittens yet? She asked. Their names are Naughty and Naughtier. She hoped that talking about the kittens would make the little girl laugh, but she still had the same solemn look on her face. All right. For the noon meal, I'm just going to make some bacon and serve some leftover bread I made yesterday with my friend, Margaret. She's Amanda and Sally's mother. Annabelle nodded. How can I help? Betty pursed her lips. She knew telling the girl to go play would do no good. Why don't you spread butter on the bread for me? I'll cut it and make the bacon, and you can spread the butter and put the bacon on the bread to make it into sandwiches. Betty quickly cut the bread into slices and gave it to the girl who worked hard to butter it exactly right. Her tongue stuck out at one corner of her mouth as she concentrated, and Betty had to hide a smile. Poor thing felt like her life was going to be one of only work now, and Betty had no idea how to help her. Malcolm came back just as the bacon was finished. It made Betty think of something her mother had always said. A man always comes home when he knows the food is ready. 
His stomach tells him when his workday is done. Thinking of her mother made her wistful and homesick for a moment, but she had responsibilities and mourning her mother all over again did nothing. Betty served three plates and poured them each a cold cup of coffee. Annabelle frowned at the brown liquid in her tin cup. Auntie said little girls can't drink coffee. Malcolm bit back a retort that the little girl did not need to be subjected to. People who drink coffee on the trail have a better chance of not getting cholera, the disease that killed your parents. You'll only drink coffee now. But my auntie said. Your auntie didn't understand about the disease, Betty said softly. The doctor is right. You need to drink the coffee. Or tea. Do you like tea? Annabelle shrugged. I never tried it. You can try it with your supper, and if you like it, then I'll let you drink tea and not coffee. Is that all right, Malcolm? That sounds like a fine plan to me. Malcolm took a bite of his sandwich. This is delicious. Annabelle buttered the bread all by herself, Betty said, wondering who the girl's auntie was. The bread is buttered perfectly. Not too much and not too little. It's exactly right. Annabelle looked pleased for just a moment, but then she concentrated on her sandwich. After lunch, I need you to go and play with Amanda and Sally for a few minutes while I talk to the doctor. All right? It might be the only way to get the girl to play at all. I need to help with the dishes so I can earn my keep. Annabelle took another bite of her sandwich and a big swallow of her coffee, grimacing at the taste. She wasn't backing down at the idea of earning her keep. That much was clear. I'll help with the dishes, Malcolm said. You play with your friends for a little while. The little girl frowned, but she finally nodded. Yes, sir. As soon as the meal was eaten, Annabelle went across the camp to her two friends, and Betty turned to her husband. She keeps telling me she has to earn her keep. I don't know how to convince her that we're keeping her whether she earns her keep or not. Malcolm frowned. I wonder where she got that idea in her head. I have no idea, but it's the same phrase over and over. I want to just hold her, but she's trying so hard to be brave and grown up, I don't think she'd let me. Betty shook her head. I don't know what to do. Just love her. She'll understand eventually that she doesn't have to do anything to have a place in our home. Malcolm got to his feet. Two buffalo were killed this morning. All of the families are sharing the meat, so I'm going to go help with the butchering and get our share. You'll have to spend the afternoon drying it, but at least you'll earn your keep. He winked at her as he sauntered off and left Betty giggling. She'd had no idea the man had a sense of humor. She hoped she learned new things about her husband every day for the rest of their lives. Before too long, Annabelle came back to the wagon where Betty was just finishing up the dishes. Amanda and Sally are taking a nap. It's probably time for you to nap too. Betty reached into the wagon and pulled out the blankets she and Malcolm had used the night before, realizing she still needed to walk out onto the prairie to find the blankets they'd left out there. Annabelle frowned. I can't nap. I have to earn my keep. Betty smiled. You earned your keep by buttering the bread. It's my most hated chore of all. The girl's eyes widened. I did? Betty was thrilled she'd found a bit of a solution to the girl's need to earn her keep, at least for the moment. You did. Now you need to nap in case I need you to butter more bread later. Annabelle scrambled into the wagon and lay down amidst all the supplies Malcolm had brought with him and the few things that belonged to her and Betty. She curled into a small little ball and Betty covered her with a blanket. Sleep well. As soon as she was sleeping, Betty hurried over to Margaret, hoping her friend would have some advice for her. She could ask Bernice, of course, but the boys were very different than little Annabelle. Bernice would have advice about high-energy boys, but not sweet little girls. Margaret smiled at her. How'd your noon meal go? 
Good. I finally got Annabelle to believe she'd already earned her keep today. Do you have any idea what that is about? I overheard her talking to Amanda. Her mother died back in Georgia, and the woman she was calling her mama was actually her aunt. The aunt talked to her constantly about being good and helping out to earn her keep. Margaret shook her head. That's terrible. How am I ever going to be able to convince her that she doesn't have to do anything to earn her place in our homes? I guess just keep showing her love. I have no other answers. I don't know how my girls would be in that situation, and I hope no one ever finds out. If your girls are ever left orphans, they will become my daughters. No worries there. Margaret smiled, hugging her friend. And the same goes for Annabelle, but surely she won't be left an orphan three times. I couldn't imagine that happening to a child. What she's been through is enough. Betty rubbed the back of her neck. I meant to ask Malcolm about a bath, but I forgot. I do have a nickel of my own money though, if you wouldn't mind. I'll start refilling the tub now. I've already had five people bathe today, and the water needs to be freshened for someone else. Betty wrinkled her nose. I would appreciate that. In fact, let me run and get my nickel, and I'll help you fill it. Then make it three cents. Thank you. Betty called as she hurried back to camp and riffled through her things until she found the precious bit of money she had with her. After paying for all the supplies she'd need, there wasn't much left. But there was more than enough for a bath, and it would be her first proper one since they'd left independence. Until that day, she'd felt she needed to save every penny in case they needed it once they arrived in Oregon. With the three pennies in hand, she went back to where Margaret was just starting to boil some water. Should I fetch more from the river? Betty asked. That would be wonderful. Between the two of them, they had the tub filled in minutes, and Betty leaned back for a moment, just enjoying the feel of the warm water surrounding her. There were sheets tied between Margaret's wagon and the wagon beside hers to give privacy though it would never really feel private to bathe out of doors. When she got out of the tub a short while later, she felt refreshed and ready to take on the world. For her, the worst part about being on the trail was missing her baths. She hated washing in the river, but Margaret was the only one who had brought along a bathtub. It had seemed so frivolous at first, but now, it felt like a lifeline to the civilization she'd left behind. She spotted Malcolm as she walked back to camp, feeling clean for the first time in weeks. He spotted her and smiled. You look fresh as a daisy. I feel fresh too. I had a lovely bath. He grinned. Did you pay Mrs. Pruitt's ridiculous price? I helped her fill the tub, so she gave me a discount. She wasn't sure why she thought it was all right to spend money without asking. Do you mind? She braced herself as she waited for the answer. Of course not. You can take a bath every week as far as I'm concerned. Did you find the money I had? No. Of course not. I wouldn't touch your money without your permission. He smiled. You have my permission from now on. I'll show you where the money is kept. But... Betty didn't feel like she'd done anything to earn the money, so it felt odd to spend it. Maybe she was more like little Annabelle than she cared to admit. We're married now. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Betty smiled. Thank you, Malcolm. Her thoughts drifted to the idea of the wedding night they'd missed. I'm not sure we can sneak away tonight with Annabelle there. She kept her voice low as she told him they would have to postpone their wedding night even longer. He shrugged. I'm sure we can't. She needs to be settled before we can even think about that again. He sighed. But we gained a daughter with absolutely no risk to you. That's a good thing. Are you that worried about the risks of childbirth? Betty hadn't realized men worried about those things. I've seen too many women die. Yes, I'm that worried. 
Not that I don't want children. I'm a strong woman. Stop worrying about that with me. I'll do my best. He took her hand in his and walked toward camp. We got all the meat butchered and divided up. I'll bring our share in a little bit. Have you dried meat before? Not before this journey, but I've done it enough since we left Independence that I feel like an expert. Betty leaned her head on his shoulder as they walked. For a man who had been a total stranger just two days before, he seemed so familiar now. I'll help if you need it. He was thinking about others he needed to check on, but he was willing to do anything he could to make her life a little easier. No, thank you. I'll probably take our meat over to Margaret, and the two of us can work together. I wouldn't be surprised if all the women in camp just meet in the middle and work on it together anyway. She liked the camaraderie she'd found with the other women in camp. If they aren't planning to all work together, you should suggest it. Many hands make light work. That's true. Even if all the women don't work together, we'll get a small group of us that will. I know it will be a great deal more enjoyable that way. She sighed, already tired. They'd slept late into the day, but it still wasn't nearly enough with the night they'd had. Malcolm smiled. You have fun with the others then. I'll start on my house calls. Wagon calls? I'm not sure what to call them while we're on the trail. Is anyone else sick? She asked, a bit startled. She hated to think that more people were going to die the way she'd watched the Nelsons die the night before. Of course, she'd known people in their company had died already, but that was the first time she'd witnessed it, and it had been truly horrible. There are a couple of people who are sick but it's not nearly as bad as the ones who have died. And there are some injuries I need to check on. Nothing major, but it's still my job to make certain everyone is all right. Betty nodded. Enjoy your wagon calls then. When she got back to camp, she found a sharp knife that she could use for trimming the meat just as thin as it could be trimmed, and then she headed back to Margaret's wagon. You don't mind if we work on the meat together, do you? I would love that. We both have to do the work and doing it together will help the time go faster and make the work easier. Margaret smiled. Go and ask your sister and Hannah to join us, and I'll ask Mary. Betty nodded. I'll do that. Mary's mother also joined them, and they had a group of six women working together. By the end of the afternoon, all were exhausted, but there was meat dried for many more meals and none of them could complain about extra food. Betty was too tired to cook a full meal that evening, so she boiled some rice and used the dried meat to make a gravy, and then she cut up pieces of the meat. If she'd thought about it earlier, she would have just cooked some of their share of the meat, but they'd been working hard to get all the meat finished, and she didn't think any of the women had thought to set some aside for their suppers. They were all too busy laughing and joking as they did their work. Annabelle had come and found her while she was working with the other women, and when she'd offered to help so she could earn her keep, Betty had simply told the girl there was no need for buttered bread, so she should go off and enjoy herself instead. Annabelle stayed and played with Margaret's girls while Betty made supper, and she came back just as Betty was finished with the meal. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bentley. I didn't know you were cooking. She looked afraid that she would be punished for her failure to arrive in time to help. Betty smiled. Don't you worry about a thing. It's my job to cook and your job to eat what I cook. The girl looked skeptical, but she sat down and accepted the bowl of strange-looking food Betty handed her. What is it? It's rice, gravy, and meat. Doesn't it sound tasty? Betty knew the meal didn't look terribly appetizing, but hopefully the girl would enjoy it anyway. Malcolm wasn't there yet, so Betty decided to wait to eat with him. She washed everything she could, which wasn't much, and still waited. Finally, an hour after Annabelle had finished, he came back looking exhausted. You didn't have to wait to eat with me. Betty frowned. You were always on time when Margaret cooked. 
I've been on time the short while you've been helping. I have been late more times than not. He hit a yawn behind his hand. One of Mr. Bedwell's boys fell and banged up his wrist. It doesn't seem broken, but I had to wrap it just in case. And then Mr. Bedwell had some questions for me, so I ended up staying much longer than I'd planned to. He accepted the bowl from her, looking into it curiously. It's just something I threw together with the ingredients I had on hand. Annabelle ate two bowls, so it must not be terrible. She served herself, and they both sat down on rocks near their campfire. This was one of the camps where it was obvious many companies had stayed before them. Some of the fires had rocks to sit on and others had tree stumps. There was even an area off in the distance where tree stumps had been cut into many different benches for people to sit on for a Sunday meeting. This is good, he said after eating a couple of bites. Did you get Annabelle to drink more coffee? We tried tea, and she liked that much better. You did say tea was almost as good as coffee. There doesn't seem to be much difference in the healthiness of people between tea and coffee. I'm sure she'll be fine if you can keep her drinking it. With enough sugar, she didn't complain even a little about it. He laughed. I would say not. Most children will drink anything if it contains a copious amount of sugar. I can use honey in it as well, but the Nelsons left a good amount of food behind, and I have taken a lot of it to add to what you had. We'll be fine. She noticed he'd finished his food and immediately stood to refill his bowl. I'm glad you like this. It was quite easy to make and a nice change from beans. It really was. Thank you for thinking of something new to cook. When they'd finished the meal and the dishes were washed, he smiled. Let's go find our girl and take a walk to retrieve the blankets we left out on the prairie. It'll be our first real outing as a family. Betty smiled. I'm not sure I'd call a walk on the prairie an outing, but I suppose it's the closest thing we'll get here, isn't it? He took her hand in his. That it is.